Okay, so to begin with, as you guys may or may not know, we have that uh, Carter blood drive that's going on right now. Uh, we give the gift of life. That's one resource that we still can't uh, reproduce in the lab. Um, also, the uh, food for the food drive uh, this month is uh, instant potatoes. Uh, you can take those by the um, library. Um, and also we have that military, uh, that food drive going on for veterans as well, collecting like canned peas, uh, beans, uh, meats like spam and such. Um, and you drop those off at the VA, which is on the second floor right after you get up the stairs where all those flags are. All right, so now we're talking about Texas politics during the Buford Jester years. Uh, basically, he was a railroad commissioner. That's what his position with the government was before that. Basically, he uh, promised that there would be no new taxes and that he would limit labor. And this is when nationally the Taft-Hartley Act was passed that put severe restrictions on uh, labor unions and uh, that was nationally. Here, uh, not only did we fully agree to that, but they passed a lot of right to work legislation, meaning that unions couldn't uh, use the fact that you had to be a union member to work at a uh, job. Uh, there was a Senate seat that was open uh, between uh, Coach Stevenson and LBJ. And uh, needless to say, LBJ, who had uh, really kind of cut his teeth with things like the uh, Rural Electrification Program, bringing electricity to the um, people of the Hill Country, and he was a big time supporter. Uh, Roosevelt's New Deal programs. He basically flew everywhere on a helicopter, which of course was something people hadn't seen before. So that was a huge kind of publicity stunt. And due to a clerical error, there had to be a recount. And it came out with LBJ being the winner. And I'm glad we wouldn't know anything in modern politics about recounts or anything like that. <laughs> During Chester's second term, he tried to get past an, a state anti-lynching bill as well as abolish the poll truck tax, something that uh, the registrar of voters had used to uh, uh, allow the exclusion of those uh, that weren't deemed ready to vote. Uh, they tried to get both those things passed, but it failed the Texas Congress. He really moved in to modernize the prisons, give the prisons livable spaces, effective walls. He gave a lot of funds to improve the state mental hospitals and schools for the handicapped. And he guided our legislature in passing the Gilmer Aiken laws that doubled the state appropriation for public schools. It helped out a lot of rural districts 
by consolidating their districts so the larger district was more effectively run and supported than the smaller school districts. And he also increased te teacher pay. But then Jester died of a heart attack. He was the first Texas governor to die while in office on July 11, 1949. And Lieutenant Governor Alan Shivers was put in his position. As that's kind of like the vice governor here in Texas. Now, he had served our state before as a senator here in Texas, not in Washington, D.C. And to raise funds, but not to have an income tax, he raised taxes on, like, cigarettes, For automobiles, uh, you can thank him that we have to have an inspection sticker. And he also passed a law saying that if you drive in the state of Texas, you have to have liability insurance. Underneath his administration's political boundaries of voting districts were redrawn to give more of a voice to the growing suburbs. By the way, did I tell you guys your final is going to be on the 7th? It's the first day of finals. That's when we're supposed to have it. I believe I'll check the thing again. It will be in person? No. Yeah. Right. Do you like the midterm part two? Now in 52, Ralph Yarbrough ran against them. And you're starting to have a division within the Democratic Party here in Texas because you have some of the liberal and progressive Democrats. They're going in one direction. Meanwhile, you have the uh, conservative Democrats that are going in another direction. Shivers was a conservative Democrat. Yarbrough was a progressive Democrat. Basically, Yarbrough lost the gubernatorial race. Uh, so then he ran for the US Senate. 
Adelaide Stevenson, Democrat, was running against uh, Eisenhower for the president. And Shivers refused to support Adelaide Stevenson, the Democrat. Instead, he threw his support to Republican Eisenhower. which totally ended one-party rule in Texas because it split the Democratic Party so much that Republicans were able to make advances in other offices. Meanwhile, something that's up there that I left out, it's during this time that you had a big fight between the U.S. government and Texas over who owned the coastal oil field, known as the Tidelands. Basically, whose water was it uh, 20 miles off the coast? Because everywhere else in the U.S., that 20 miles off the coast, that's considered America. Well, when we join the United States, we are the only state where we own our own land. The federal government has to buy it or rent it if they want it from us. And due to the fact that we had a Navy during our years as a republic was one of the things that basically helped Texas keep claim to all of her waters uh, that the territorial waters off the coast of Texas belong to Texas, not the U.S. And the big fight basically was over who's going to own the oil that's found there. Well, in 1954, another election, he basically passes higher corporate franchise taxes as well as taxes on uh, gathering gas in the gas fields, and he increases the taxation on beer. Well, what does he spend the money that he's collecting on? Well, basically, he spends it on uh, schools. He builds more schools, increases teachers' pay. Meanwhile, the fact that uh, he made everybody have liability insurance here in Texas makes people like Yarborough curious about the potentiality of backroom deals and Yarborough demands an insurance investigation. I'm seeing if he was helping out failing insurance companies, which by the way he was. Meanwhile, in the world, Cold War tensions are increasing. In 1949, to everybody's shock, China uh, falls to communism underneath Chairman Mao Zedong. And the U.S. had given billions to support Chiang Kai-shek, who was their democratic leader. In 
Oh, um, by the way, uh, Adolf Hitler killed 8 million people. Uh, Joseph Stalin killed uh, 20 million people, of his own people. And uh, Mao Zedong killed, estimates are 100 million of his own people. Well, a lot of that was due to starvation, re-education, when he was going from an architectural to an industrial world. But he built such a cult of personality, the people in China still love him. Did you mean agricultural, not architectural? Agricultural. Did I say architectural? Then I was being silly. Not only that, but in, in, uh, they invade South Korea, where now communism is physically trying to expand and take over on the world scene. <clears throat> so needless to say, America wants to pick up the torch of liberty, but they use this fear of unionism, I mean of communism, to fight labor unions at a huge strike they were having at Port Arthur. While in Hollywood they were blacklisting and not hiring members of the, or someone people suspected with being members of the Communist Party. Here in Texas we pass legislation for a $20,000 fine for being a member of the Communist Party. Then in 1954, the case of Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education is heard that basically says separate is not equal and we have to uh, desegregate schools with all possible speed while well, the Texas government refuses to support that. Then in his last term, Alan Shivers faces a lot of scandal because they had set aside all this money for the Veterans Land Board, an agency that was going to help vets get land here in Texas. I mean, I'm talking about in the millions this fund had been set aside for. And Roland Kenneth Towery in South Texas, a journal, a journalist, and by the way, he earned a Pulitzer Prize for his investigation, found out basically that uh, they were way overcharging the veterans for the land that was given to them. And then he also got blamed for a lot of lax oversight of the collapsing insurance agents. during the late 1950s. Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, is a senator. He finally becomes the Senate Majority Leader. He really starts pushing for like health care, funds for education, help out the environment.
underneath Eisenhower, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 is signed that basically like uh, authorized the Justice Department to send federal marshals to make sure that no funny business was going on at the uh, state election districts. Meanwhile, after um, after uh, Shivers, Governor Price Daniel is elected into a position. No relation to Papio Daniel. And underneath him, three anti-immigration measures were put into law. Even though they were later overturned. The turbulent decade, reform and reaction, 1960 to 1972. Well guys, as you can see, Texas is kind of dragging its feet, as is the rest of the United States into moving into a, what a society like we would call today our society. They were hesitant to do it back then. During this time, some groups just aren't willing to wait for it. And a huge event happens that is used exceptionally well by Lyndon Baines Johnson to take this country where it needed to go, but where it was not ready to go. Everybody have the title? All right. Early 1960s Texas politics. All right, some big names. We have LBJ, who's a Democrat in Washington, D.C. He runs for president in 1960. In the uh, Democratic uh, primary, it's him versus John F. Kennedy. And basically John F. Kennedy, because uh, LBJ would bring Texas with him, and Texas is so important for electoral college votes, uh, basically makes him his vice president. Uh, as uh, LBJ's seat is open, Senator John Tower, a lawyer from Dallas, uh, he runs for it and he takes the position. Now, Dallas was also home of Major General Edwin Walker, who was a virulent anti-communist, anti-big government, this guy, this guy was leading anti-Kennedy marches before uh, Kennedy came here. And I think there may have been an assassination attempt on his life, but I'm not, I don't believe so. And we also have John Connolly, a progressive yet conservative Democrat, elected to the governor position. 
You know what's frustrating about making these slides? Every time I do this R, it gives me the register, where you have the R with the circle around it, like a registered trademark. You have to go Control Z, no. Okay. What is John Connolly again? Huh? What did you say about John Connolly? What did I say about what? John, John Connolly? He was a progressive, yet conservative Democrat. He's a governor. He was elected governor. And he was much more willing to go in the way of Lyndon Baines Johnson and to be accepting of those kind of ideas than many of his predecessors. Now, early civil rights activism. Well, guys, by the early 1960s, a lot of minorities are no longer willing to just sit back and wait and let the government do something. You start to have this sit-in movement. This actually began in Greensboro, North Carolina. There's a picture of it right there, where four black students just went into the uh, white section of the lunch counter, sat down in the seats, and refused to move. Now, of course, there were other black students that if one had to let go use the restroom, they changed places. And they sat there. And guys, that, uh, they, that happened at the Woolworth in Greensboro. And it lasted a whole week for that Woolworth said, okay, we'll go ahead and integrate the lunch counter because we're missing out on money. Now, if only everything could be that uh, nonviolent. Meanwhile, in Houston, at Texas Southern University, on March 4th, 1960, at the Wine Gardens lunch counter, students did the exact same thing, sitting in the uh, white reserved section and basically refusing to give up. Basically, this caused uh, Houston to uh, go towards a um, policy of accommodation and kind of a piecemeal brokered desegregation where this integration was gradual. Indeed, by 1962, hotels in Houston are totally integrated. They no longer have black rooms or white rooms. And the eighth wonder of the world, the Astrodome, that's what they used to advertise it as. It was getting ready to be open, and it was totally desegregated. Um, by the way, nationally, the sit-in movement turned into like a wade-in movement at public pools where you had blacks using uh, white areas and public swimming pools. You had pray-ins where um, black congregants were crossing the line in churches. So that's what's going on in Houston at about the same time. In Austin, you see a lot of uh, protests demanding integration of higher education. These took out like at UT. At Huston Tilson. At Concordia Lutheran and St. Ed's. Because even though 
UT had supposedly um, desegregated in 1950. They still had separate facilities, separate services, everything like that. The businesses that were supporting the university, like on the drag and nearby, also had uh, separation, as well as at the other universities. And basically, they were saying no more. In Dallas, this movement was against the lower schools. And we're not as successful. Not until a big event happens here in Dallas. But basically, how the populace responded to these, again, split the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party first had its huge split when Truman, Harry S. Truman, desegregated the U.S. Army. That's when you had the first wave that broke off. Well, then we had, you know, governors here that were making waves break off. Now this is even further weakening the Democratic Party. Then we got Kennedy. Now, guys, everybody who, for some reason, America loves to fall in love with John F. Kennedy when in reality it doesn't reflect what was really going on on the ground. Everybody talks about, oh, he was so popularly elected. No, he won by a few thousand votes. And, you know, kind of like Biden, the Electoral College didn't win by that much, and in some states it was a hair measure. So, just like that, Kennedy basically had to rule from the virtual center. So in terms of race, he was very cautious in his moves. Like while, yes, he did promote Thurgood Marshall, the lead attorney on the uh, Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education case, as well as head counsel for the NAACP, he promoted him to the Supreme Court. At the same time, he also promoted segregate judges that supported segregation to other federal courts. And when given an opportunity, he did not ban racial segregation in federal housing. Because once again, he was walking a tightrope. And he also had a slew of uh, foreign problems against him, like underneath him we have the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have the building of the Berlin Wall. And by the time it's up for uh, his next go-round, his popularity is languishing. Basically, his economic uh, attempts failed. His popularity was sagging. That's why he was in Texas in November. On November 21st, he'd flown into Houston, given a speech. Then he flew into uh, San Antonio, gave another speech, flew into Austin. No, no, no. He flew into Austin, gave a speech. Flew to San Antonio, gave a speech, flew up to Fort Worth, where he didn't give a speech because he just wanted to stay the night, be ready for the next morning. On the morning of the 22nd, he spoke at a breakfast to uh, supporters, and then he came to Texas. I mean, he came to Dallas. And it is at this time 